Right. Um, so for the, for that purpose, because we had um, uh, we wanted to have an event, uh, a caucus meeting on each of the critical areas of concern from the Beijing Platform for Action, and this is also breast cancer, you know, awareness. And we thought that we wanted to have a subject. We wanted to have a, an event on women and health. Uh, very kindly, Janet has agreed to share with us her thoughts on um, breast cancer prevention. So, without further ado, I'll pass the floor over to you, Janet. And then, what we what we intend to do is to have maybe about twenty minutes presentation about the issue, and then we're going to break into groups to discuss the issue further amongst ourselves because. We found that people really appreciate the opportunity to um, discuss amongst themselves and we can come back and have a feedback. And then at the end of, before the end of the session, we'll have an update on CSW 65. So that is our intended program for today. And without further ado, I hand the floor over to you, Janet. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here and just give me a second to share my screen. Dr. Janet Maker is the author of The Thinking Woman's Guide to Breast Cancer, Taking Charge of Your Recovery and Remission. Following her own diagnosis of breast cancer in 2011, she became a passionate advocate for patient empowerment. After her treatment, she could not simply return to her former life because she was at high risk for recurrence. Working with an integrative oncologist, she made major lifestyle changes. She follows a program of diet, supplements, exercise, stress reduction, and avoidance of environmental carcinogens. Janet has a PhD in educational psychology from the University of Southern California. And uh, her academic background was a big help in doing the research that she needed to make her own treatment decisions. Janet has been in remission for breast cancer for over 10 years, and I'm very proud and happy to introduce my friend, Janet. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Nina, and um, I'm going to share my screen now, I hope. All right, so I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 20, 2011, and since that time, I've been working with an integrative oncologist to try to remain in remission. And the things that I do to stay in remission are the same things you would do to prevent breast cancer in the first place. So an integrative oncologist is a physician trained in both conventional oncology and alternative methods. Conventional oncologists don't really talk much about prevention. What they do is some kind of combination of surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and hormones, and that's it. They're done unless the cancer comes back. The problem is that if it does come back, it's likely no longer curable. So we want to prevent it from coming back. And the an integrative oncologists say that there's a second part to cancer treatment, and that is to change what they call your terrain or your body to make it more resistant to cancer. So cancer prevention is important because according to the World Health Organization, breast cancer is now the most common cancer diagnosis. And cancer rates in general are on the rise. Between 2000 and 2020, it went from 10 million cases worldwide to about 20 million cases. And it's expected to increase another 50% by 2040. So now about one in five people worldwide will develop cancer during their lifetime. So what causes breast cancer? According to the American Cancer Society, fewer than 15% of breast cancer patients have any family history. So that implies that more than 85% could be environmental, which means it's largely preventable. And the things that we do to prevent it would be to avoid the things that cause cancer and also build up the body's resistance to cancer. It's important to recognize that tests do not prevent cancer. Tests are, what they do is early detection at best, and that's, that's good and useful, but it's not the same as prevention. The precautionary principle says that when an activity raises a threat of harm to humans or the environment, 
even if the even if the connection is not 100% proven scientifically, there's still a, a obligation to protect the public. So it's a way, another way of saying it is better safe than sorry. But the precautionary principle is used much more in Europe and Canada than it is in the US. So many products are banned in, in Europe and Canada that we use to still use in the US. And we kind of use the opposite of the precautionary principle. In the US, industry can go ahead and release the products, and then it's up to consumers to show that they're dangerous. And this is very hard to do because cancer is an accumulation of a lot of factors that develop over time. So to go back and trace it to one product at one time is really very difficult. So about 100,000 chemicals have been released since 1940. And of those, only about 1,000 have been tested to see if they're carcinogenic. And of those 1,000, only one was shown to be non-carcinogenic. Approximately 100 have been classified as known carcinogens, about 300 as possible or probable carcinogens, and the rest are unclassified. And that's not because they're okay, that's because they need more testing. So we can see from this that neither industry nor the government is going to protect us. So it's up to us to protect ourselves and our families. These are some of the places that you'll find environmental carcinogens, air, water, food, basically everywhere. So it looks overwhelming because we do have to protect ourselves in all those areas, but it isn't as overwhelming as it looks because any little thing that you do helps. And you can start with the easy things, which is what I did, and then just add on one step at a time. These are some of the toxins that are found in drinking water. So the United States has the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act, and Canada has the Canada Water Act. Canadian and US water are kind of linked because they're, the border is 40% water because of the Great Lakes. So contamination in one place is likely to contaminate the other. Europe has the EU Water Framework Directive, which is more comprehensive, but it depends on the country. So the EPA in the US and the and government agencies elsewhere only test a limited range of known contaminants because remember there are 100,000. And also the research that they do on safe levels of the contaminants and combinations of different contaminants is also poor. So again, we have to protect ourselves. The Environmental Working Group is uh, probably the primary organization in the US working to protect consumers in the environment. And they have a guide to safe drinking water. So if you go to their website and you click on, on well, the step number one is to find out what's in your tap water. So you click on that link, put in your zip code and your water provider, and it tells you what you have. So I did that. I live in Los Angeles, I put in my zip code. And these are the eight carcinogens that I have that are above safe levels. So number one is arsenic. And my water has more than, my water has 520 times the EWG's healthy guidelines. And that's just carcinogens. There are other toxins that are also in my water. So then you go to step two and you buy a filter for whatever it is that's in your particular water. And the EWG has a guide to buying water filters on their website. You have to change your filters on time and they recommend uh, drinking filtered tap water instead of bottled water. The reason for that is that bottled water usually is just filtered tap water, but it costs 500 to 3000 times as much and the bottles are also dangerous. They recommend that you carry your water in safe bottles, that is glass or stainless steel, not plastic. 
Pregnant women and infants should always have safe water. And they also recommend a whole house water filter. That's because we absorb toxins through our skin as well as by drinking. So bathing and showering should also be safe. And if, and if you don't, if you live in an apartment, you can buy a filter just for your shower and sink. So food has many of the same contaminants that water has, chemical pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and antibiotics are routinely given to food animals to protect them from the unsanitary conditions that are found on factory farms. In the US, 99% of all food animals are raised on factory farms. And Europe and Canada also permit factory farms, but the percentage is not as high. According to the EWG, 87% of US meat samples tested from beef, pork, chicken, and turkey were contaminated by antibiotic resistant bacteria, which is the result of giving too many antibiotics. So when we eat the meat, we also eat the bacteria that makes us resistant to antibiotics. And the World Health Organization has called for an end to preventive antibiotics for food animals because it contributes to antibiotic resistance. So the, the European Parliament banned the practice or limited the use of the practice, but the legislation won't become law until 2022. And there's also a movement in the US and Canada to limit antibiotic use. Hormones are given to cattle and sheep to make them grow faster and increase milk production. Europe bans most growth hormones under the precautionary principle, but they're mostly still used in the US and Canada. Hormone residues in meat will disrupt human hormone balance, causing developmental problems, reproductive problems, and it can lead to breast, prostate, and colon cancer. Another danger is irradiation. So some foods are irradiated with high doses of ionizing radiation and that kills the bacteria and insects and extends shelf life, but it can leave behind chemical byproducts that promote genetic damage and tumor growth. And GMOs, finally, also known as genetically modified, genetically engineered, transgenic, or bioengineered, are not created by selective breeding. They're created by actually exchanging DNA between organisms that would not be able to breed in nature. So the resulting GMO can be patented and trademarked. The problem is that we don't know how the new DNA will affect our DNA. So basically this is a science experiment. And most of the European countries have either partially or fully banned GMOs, but they're still mostly permitted in the US and Canada. So industry claims that GMOs are safe but the Center for Food Safety says that they can put people at a higher risk for cancer and many other diseases. And they're also a risk for farm animals, wildlife and the environment. GMOs can be either plants or animals. We've been eating genetically modified plants since the 1990s. So far, only two food animals have been approved for human consumption. And that was a salmon in Canada and the US and a pig in the US. About 30% of dairy products in the US, but not Europe or Canada, use recombinant bovine growth hormone, which is a genetically modified hormone made by Monsanto. So GM cows produce more milk, but the milk contains pus, bacteria, and antibiotics because the hormones can cause mastitis, which is an infection of the udders. And most of the beef cattle and sheep raised for their meat are also treated with genetically modified hormones, which makes them grow faster. And they're also fed genetically modified corn or soy. So we're exposed to hormones and GMOs when we eat their meat. So the solution is that food should be organic, which means that it was produced without conventional pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, irradi irradiation, or GMOs. 
and organic meat, dairy, and eggs come from animals that were not given antibiotics or growth hormones. There's a complicated labeling system that includes things like organic, humanely raised, GMO-free, grass-fed, cage-free, and so forth. And it's worth taking the time to understand the labels because they are confusing and sometimes they're intentionally misleading. So you think you're buying something healthy and you're not. Consumer Reports has a description of all the labels on the website. And there are also labels for EU organic and Canada organic. The endocrine system is a network of glands that secretes hormones and anything that disrupts that system is an endocrine disruptor. And they have larger effects on cancers that are affected by hormones like breast endometrium and ovaries in women and prostate cancer in men. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are all over the environment and they cause birth defects, developmental disorders and cancerous tumors. The World Health Organization estimated about 800 chemicals are known or suspected to be capable of interfering with hormones. Since the 1950s, US cattle and sheep have been treated with several EDCs, including the growth hormones we just discussed. And neither the meat nor the dairy products come with any labeling that would let consumers know. And they're also in agriculture, EDCs are in fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides. So EDCs are in our food, water, air, household products, really all over the environment. And in addition to that, we also have prescription horm hormone disruptors in the form of birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, and the anti-estrogen pills that breast cancer survivors like, like me get. And all of them are endocrine disruptors. And there's clear evidence that hormones originating outside the body can interfere with our own hormone function. So for example, estrogen is classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a group one carcinogen. So the EWG has identified 12 of the worst EDCs and call that, they call them the dirty dozen. And if you go to their website, it will describe the products that you will find them in and also how to avoid them. In general, the way you avoid them is by using water filters for drinking, cooking, and bathing, making sure everything you eat is organic, and avoiding plastics, and then all those coatings, permanent press, nonstick, whatever, because uh, they contain a lot of chemicals. Plastics are filled with toxic chemicals that leach into food and water from the plastic containers or into teethers and toys that are chewed by children. So probably the two chemicals considered most dangerous are BPA and phthalates. And they are both endocrine disruptors with, that are associated with breast and prostate cancers and many other diseases. The US, Canada and Europe have all banned some of those ingredients in some products, especially toys for children, but they haven't really gone far enough. And plastic also poses a danger to the environment because it pollutes air, water, and soil. And they take between 100 and 1,000 years to degrade. So the best solution is to reduce the amount of plastic we use. And some ideas are using water bottles made of glass or stainless steel reusable grocery bags, avoiding plastic food packaging, using glass storage in your kitchen instead of plastic, wood or metal toys for children and organic or cloth diapers. So kitchenware and food packaging also contain some food related dangers. In 2005, the EPA found that a chemical called PFOA was a likely human carcinogen. And it was the main ingredient in making Teflon, the nonstick coating used on kitchenware. And PFOA is also used in food packaging for greasy items like microwave popcorn bags, pizza boxes, and wraps for French fries. It's also used in a lot of non-food related items, which we'll get to later. 
In 2019, more than 180 countries agreed to ban PFOAs for most uses. And the manufacturers agreed to replace the PFOA, but when the EWG tested the replacements, they really weren't any safer. And another dangerous ingredient is aluminum cookware because aluminum crosses the blood brain barrier and it's been found in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. So your solutions are to avoid nonstick coatings and avoid aluminum. Aluminum cookware is usually anodized, which means it's, it has a safe coating, but because coatings can always be scratched or damaged, it's still safer to stick to glass, ceramic, stainless steel, and cast iron. Many people think of the skin as a barrier, but because of its pores, it really acts more like a screen. So when you put something on your skin or your scalp, it can actually be worse than eating, some, eating the toxic chemicals. Because when you eat something, the enzymes in your digestive system break them down and flush out toxins. But when you put it on your skin, it goes directly into the bloodstream without any filtering. So toxins are found in basically everything, makeup, product for skin, hair, teeth, nails, products for babies and men. And the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health estimates about 900 toxic chemicals used in personal care products. And the US does not require any testing for safety. And it's legal for manufacturers to put known carcinogens in them without any labeling. Manufacturers are also allowed to make false claims like organic or natural. And the EWG has testified before Congress that about one in five personal care products are linked to cancer. Europe and Canada both have stricter guidelines than the US and they restrict hundreds of products that are allowed in the US and they also have better requirements for disclosure and labeling. So to be safe, we should switch to non-toxic products. And the EWG has developed a mark that you can use to recognize safe products. So you can look for that mark when you shop. And you can also go online and use their database where they have reviewed about 70,000 personal care products. There are also known and suspected carcinogens in household cleaning products including anything antibacterial because they contain pesticides, cleaning products for bathroom, kitchen, floors, dishes, laundry, basically everything. And it's hard to check because they are not required to list their ingredients on the package. This is also true in Europe and Canada. And in the US, they're allowed to use deceptive words like safe, non-toxic, green, and biodegradable. So consumers don't have the information they need to choose safer products. And the EWG has a hall of shame for toxic cleaning products that make bogus claims. And most of your major brands are in there. The situation is improving recently. In 2016, the Obama administration passed a chemical safety act and of course it was never enforced, but now that we have a new administration, we can hope that it will be. Meanwhile, some state and local governments have been passing laws to protect consumers. And in 2015, the EPA started their Safer Choice program. They screen cleaning products for carcinogens and other toxins. And about 2000 products now carry their Safer Choice mark. So you can look for that mark when you shop. Other reliable marks are Green Seal, Green Guard, and Echo Logo. Not all marks are reliable. Echo Logo is also used in Canada, and Europe uses the EU Echo label as well as labels for different countries. And the EWG plans to expand their EWG verified mark to include household cleaners. They also have a guide to healthy cleaning on the website, which reviews 2,500 products. And finally, if, if you're a do-it-yourself person, you can make your own cleaning products by using recipes that you can easily find on the internet. So lawn and garden products contain 
chemical pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers that can be absorbed through the skin or by inhaling sprays, dusts, or vapors. And they're especially dangerous for children and pets, and they're also harmful for the environment. You might have heard of the glyphosate controversy. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, which is an herbicide and endocrine disruptor made by Monsanto. It's used by farmers in their fields, by homeowners in their gardens, and also in public parks and gardens. And in 2015, the World Health Organization issued a warning that glypho glyphosate can cause cancer in humans. However, the European Food Safety Authority, Health Canada, and the EPA in the US did not find that it caused a hazard for humans. So some European countries, Canadian provinces, and US states on their own have banned it to some degree. And localities have too. So for example, in the US, the Organic Consumers Association on their own had a public campaign uh, which resulted in about 50 US cities and counties banning glyphosate for use in public parks, playgrounds, and schoolyards. So there, is, there are now some gardeners who specialize in organic lawn and landscape care. So you can hire someone or you can do it yourself. And to make it easier, Planet Natural on their website has listed steps so you can gradually transition to organic lawn and garden care. So we absorb toxins through our skin. So we need to avoid toxic fabrics as well. And the six to toxic fabrics you see there are all synthetics or at the bottom, different coatings. So like permanent press and things like that often contain PFOAs like we had in Teflon. So it's better to use natural fibers, um, cotton, silk, wool, linen, hemp, cashmere. Viscose and lyocell, trade name Tencel, are also natural. They come from trees. And bamboo is good because it doesn't use any pesticides or chemicals when it grows. However, there's still a problem because uh, pesticides and herbicides will not only be on food that's not organic, it will also be on textiles that are, are not organic, including sheets, towels, clothing, and tampons. So you should try to buy textiles that are organic as much as possible. And it's good to avoid chemical dry cleaning and to wash your clothes in a green detergent. Our last environmental carcinogen is radiation. And the main uh, distinction in terms of health is whether it's ionizing or non-ionizing. Ionizing radiation has enough energy to remove electrons from atoms and turn them into ions, which create free radicals. And cancer is the illness that's most associated with ionizing radiation because it damages DNA. And it affects rapidly dividing cells the most. So that would be infants, young children, and pregnant women. Non-human non sources of ionizing radiation include cosmic rays and radioactive elements in the earth. And that amounts to about 311 millirems a year in most places. Um, and human-made ionizing radiation would be nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, medical tests and procedures, and other sources like food irradiation and some consumer products. And that amounts to about another 311 millirems a year. So it basically doubles. The cancers that develop first are thyroid and leukemia within a few years of exposure. And the ones that take 10 to 15 years are breast, lung, skin, stomach, and multiple myeloma. So we're already seeing an increase in those things in Japan because of Fukushima, which was 2011. And likewise, radiation therapy for breast cancer can cause secondary cancers that show up years later. So non-ionizing radiation 
is electromagnetic radiation that does not have enough energy to remove electrons from atoms. So it does not directly damage the DNA like ionizing radiation does, but it can cause damage in other ways. So you see some examples on the slide there. So we're exposed to electromagnetic fields from the earth itself and from human made sources like power lines, household wiring, electrical appliances, TV and computer screens give off several kinds of radiation, mostly in the extremely low frequency range. And cell phones and cell phone towers use radio frequency and low level microwave radiation. And microwave radiation is also used in microwave ovens and radar equipment. Some microwave food can be dangerous. For example, the nonstick coatings inside popcorn bags can break down and cause uh, interact with chemicals that cause cancer. Most non-ionizing radiation is at levels below what's considered dangerous, but the effects of all radiation are cumulative. So today's children, when they reach adulthood, will have been exposed to much more radiation than we were. So it's hard to control most sources of radiation, but most of them are very small. One thing we can control is our medical procedures and the radiation from those can be really significant. So you can see from this table that dental x-rays are very low, but CT and PET scans are very high. No dose is considered safe. Each person's chance of developing cancer depends not only on the dose, but also on their exposure to other carcinogens, the health of their immune system and genetics. So we need to take precautions. And the Harvard Medical School has a list of precautions we should take. So the first one is to discuss high dose imaging. So for example, if your doctor wants you to have a CT scan, you should ask what difference it will make in your treatment. So for example, maybe it could save you from a, a surgery or an invasive procedure. In that case, it would be a good idea, but sometimes it isn't worth doing. Secondly, you should keep track of your radiation exposure, preferably for your lifetime, but at least your recent exposure. And if you have kids, you should keep track of theirs because they're exposed to more radiation than we were. Three, you should ask if you can use a lower dose test or one that doesn't use radiation like ultrasound or MRI and see if you can test less frequently, like increase the time between tests or if they're not really helping, use a different approach. And finally, don't ask for a scan as part of a thorough checkup. Don't get them unless they're going to lead to a clear benefit. So we can protect our health by avoiding toxins, but we can also build up our immune system to better handle whatever toxins we're exposed to. So for diet, I'm supposed to eat a lot of organic fruits and vegetables and whole grains, avoid refined and high glycemic carbs like sugar and, and refined carbohydrates. I avoid meat and dairy, but I can have fish. So this was a big adjustment for me because I was kind of a foodie, but I've still been able now to find ways to enjoy eating. And luckily I like fish. And also I'm allowed organic red wine, dark beer and dark chocolate. So I have some rewards and I'm allowed to cheat and eat everything, anything I want four times a year. So I can look forward to holidays and my birthday. For supplements, I get a blood test every few months for the things that are associated with cancer and we correct anything that's off with supplements and sometimes prescription drugs. For exercise, researchers advise four to seven hours of moderate to intense exercise per week because exercise controls blood sugar and limits the levels of insulin growth factor, which is a hormone that can affect breast cells. And finally, stress reduction. Even mainstream cancer centers now offer things like yoga, meditation, and Tai Chi to reduce stress because there's a proven link between stress and cancer. So I would say my primary coping mechanism for me is to monitor my thoughts and feelings and my relationships to make sure they promote happiness rather than stress. So for example, you hear people talk about battling cancer, but I never think of it that way because to me, battling is stressful. So I think in terms of curing my cancer. So in summary, 
most causes of breast cancer are preventable. Only about 15% are hereditary. So to a large extent, they're preventable. And we know that industry and government won't protect us. And to some extent, conventional medicine won't either because their focus is on killing cancer, not on keeping us healthy. So we have to do it ourselves. And we can do that with some combination of nutrition, exercise, stress management, and avoiding carcinogens. So my book is The Thinking Woman's Guide to Breast Cancer. And the subtitle is Take Charge of Your Recovery and Remission. So what we talked about today was from the remission part and it just skimmed the surface. The book goes into great detail, all the things I found out. It's the book that I wish I had when I was diagnosed. There's a website and you can sign up for a free newsletter and there are resources and contact information there. And these are some of the resources we talked about in the presentation and you are welcome to take a screenshot if you like. Um, notice the first one is me, Janet Maker. So if you have anything you wanna discuss about breast cancer, feel free to email me. And I wanna thank you for inviting me and I'm happy to answer questions. That, that's great. Thanks ever so much, Janet. Very, very informative. And I think um, a lot of food for thought for, for all of us. Um, I'm a, a, a part of an organization called um, the Association for, Ca for Cancer Prevention. And uh, there's a lot of research that, that um, you know, that is backs up obviously, I think everything that you said. And the reason why it doesn't seem to be out there in the public domain is because it's within the interest of the pharmaceutical industry to, to hide it and to, to, to not uh, really promote that information. So one of the things that has been said by um, a lot of people for Zooms is because you'll get very Zoomed out, is they really uh, enjoy having, breaking out into rooms and having small discussions. So I know that people will have a lot of questions, but maybe what we can do is if we break into rooms for about um, say 10 minutes, that will allow people to chat amongst themselves and to maybe come up with some key questions from their from their group that they would like to ask you. And then we can come back and we can take the questions, but it'll be after the a chance for people to have a discussion. Um, so we'll break into rooms now for about, um, about 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and give you some questions if that's okay. Yes, we always find, I think that whenever we break into rooms, or even though there's not enough time, people, or we seem to enjoy having that a little bit more human sort of contact with each other. So um, room three was very lucky because they had Janet in the room with them. So maybe what we can do is take uh, questions or comments from room one and then room two. And then Janet, I don't know if you can then maybe get a synthesis answer to the questions that you get um, if you if we take them all in one go. Okay, so room one, over to you. What, what were your questions or comments, please? You know, I can't remember if we were room one or two. Well, we, we were two, I think. Yeah, I think Daniela's room was... Daniela's oh. room. Okay, so we discussed the cost affordability versus prevention of cancer. And when looking at what it takes and how much it costs to have uh, a healthy lifestyle, uh, it becomes too expensive. I gave the example of Canada. Since the pandemic, the cost of food has increased three times. So trying to, to have a healthy diet, not everybody can afford it. Another point is the ingredients that they are being used into the cosmetics. Again, Hari, she, she made a great comment on that, saying that if we purchase, for example, um, a biological product to use for our skin, it's going to be much more costly versus any other available product. Uh, we also linked women's health and cancer prevention methods to the Beijing platform. And we, are, we looked at the question, how do we facilitate um, the awareness of, of cancer awareness to be part of any, uh, the Beijing platform, right? But it's already part of women's health as an issue, 
that's been raised since uh, CSW 62, uh, healthcare. Uh, another issue that we looked at was government policies and the strength of lobbies. The pharmaceutical companies versus uh, the um, farmers, for example. In Canada, farmers, they are being subsidized. Overproduction and waste of food happens all the time. Therefore, the products become more expensive uh, for anybody to, to be able, like pure biological products in Canada are very, very expensive. You need to have a very high income to be able to have an absolutely biological based um, food to consume. So these are some of the things we looked at. Uh, one question that I would like to ask Janet uh, in terms of cost affordability when it comes to uh, food consumption. Um, maybe it's a bit too personal, but what was the impact, uh, the economic impact on your personal budget trying to have a healthy lifestyle from perspective of food consumption, cosmetics, um, even going to the gym? Thanks ever so much, Rima. So basically the questions are about the cost of the healthy alternatives and the lobbies. So that's uh, the, the first set of questions. And I think room two, you've got six questions. So please go ahead and say your questions and then uh, Janet can answer all of them. Sure, actually it, it was five. Questions. Now it's Susan Lee that's okay. going to ask the questions. So please go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Ulla. Um, yeah, we actually had five questions and some of them reflect what Daniela said. Uh, we wondered about uh, US, uh, U.S. government action on some of these environmental hazards under Biden. Uh, does Janet see, um, you know, some hopefulness for that? Or what, what are the challenges under the Biden administration to really have government regulation to address some of this? Uh, and we also wondered about, um, is there education in schools, especially for teenagers, about breast cancer prevention? Um, thinking, uh, you know, they're, you know as, as, as young women uh, start to mature, um, are, are they being educated? And we also wondered about educating men that a lot of breast cancer, um, uh, 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 that a lot of breast cancer cases are uh, of men with breast cancer. And uh, someone said they thought it was about 20% of all breast cancer cases. So uh, is there an effort to try to educate men? Uh, we also want to know about uh, breast self exams. Um, here in the US at one time, they were telling us every month, you, everyone should do a breast self exam to try to detect new cancers, uh, but recently they've said, no, that's not so important. And so I wondered, Janet, if you had any uh, thoughts about that. And then our, our last question was about subsidies um, and government uh, force behind toxic polluting plants. So th th these are industrial plants that actually uh, pollute and cause health problems and they're subsidized by the government or in other ways promoted by the government. And um, the person asking this said a national security argument is sometimes used. We need this for national security. It doesn't matter if it's local pollution. And the example given was a nuclear power plant in the southern part of the United States that um, has a lot of negatives uh, for the health of the surrounding area. And yet the, uh, the government is behind it. And so does Janet, specifically with nucle nuclear uh, plants, does Janet have any thoughts on that? So th those are our questions. Thank you very much. Great set of questions. So, Jana, over to you. All right. Um, I'm going to try to combine some of these, and please let me know if uh, I'm missing anything. Um, the U.S. government under Biden, um, Biden is a supporter of fossil fuels. And so in terms of what we can expect environmentally, it's going to certainly be better than the last administration and maybe better than any previous administration possibly, but it's not gonna be, I, I don't think that it's gonna be what we would wish for. Um, it'll be a compromise and one that progressives are not gonna really be happy with, but still better than what we've had. Um, education in the schools, um, I really don't know. I mean, it should be part of health education but whether it is or not, I think it just depends on the school and um, the resources that the school has. Uh, education in the US is very stratified in terms of income levels and what's available that way. Men are about 1% of uh, breast cancer 
there. Uh, so for example, in the US, there are about 40,000 cases of women's breast cancer and only uh, about 400 of men, but they should still be educated because it happens and they, they're less aware of it, of course, than women are. Um, breast health exams. I think that they are a good idea. Um, mine would not have been caught on an exam, uh, my own exam, because uh, I didn't have a lump. I had, I mean, it wasn't something that could be felt. So it's not, it's not, and you shouldn't do that instead of other types of exams, but um, you know, why not? It doesn't really hurt to do that. I mean, a lot of people find their lump when they're taking a shower or something and catch it at a time that if they hadn't caught it then would have gotten worse. And subsidies to polluters. Um, yeah, I mean, they talk about externalizing the cost. So, Industry is able to make profits on what they sell and then the damage they do is externalized. In other words, taxpayers have to clean it up. Um, there's always a political argument about that, you know, about trying to make the polluters clean up their own messes. But um, in the United States, most, um, we don't have a campaign finance for politicians. Their campaigns are largely financed by corporations. And so when somebody pays you to, you know, so you can keep your job, then most likely you're gonna be uh, voting in, in their favor. So really the, the key in the United States anyway to um, government regulation is probably campaign finance reform because as long as the corporations are funding them probably you know, they're gonna vote that way. Personally, when I vote, I do not vote for people who receive uh, corporate money because of that. And in the, the previous group, uh, there were a lot of questions about cost and cost is a really big issue. It's a social justice issue. Um, not only can people not many people not afford uh, healthy food, but they in poor areas in the United States anyway, probably everywhere, they have what they call food deserts, which means that they don't even sell healthy foods. You, you have fast food joints and that's kind of it. And then particularly, you know, with the low wages that we have now, people are working so much that they don't really have time to go home and cook anyway, you know, picking up fast food is cheap and fast. And so that's what they're gonna probably do because eating healthy largely um, to a large extent requires cooking and that requires time. So it's a, it, again, it's, you know, people who have money and time are gonna be healthier. It's, it's um, just as really a terrible injustice. Um, did I cover everything? Um, yeah, there was something about the lobby, the the farmers' lobby, and and uh, versus there, the farmers. There are farmers. some political action groups um, on the other side for environmental justice and for breast cancer. Um, so you can become involved politically on on the good side and try to counteract the bad guys. <laughs> um, so if you have time, you know, I, I know that you're all involved or you wouldn't be here. Um, if you if you want to contribute money or time to any of these organizations, I think that's probably all we can do because um, campaign finance and so forth being the way it is, the um, money speaks. I mean, politicians will re respond to money and they'll respond to voters. And so that's why I always, for example, sign petitions because if I can't contribute a lot of money, at least I can let them know what I think, not that they necessarily care, but the more pressure they get, the better. The more they hear from us, the better. Thank you so much. Was there anything in addition that room one, room three wanted to say? Right, uh, I know that you had Janet in the room, you were able to ask lots of questions, but were there any comments you wanted to make in addition to what's been said? If not, that's fine. We just got um, a couple more minutes. So before we go on to CSW, for, were, were there any other questions that anybody had for Janet or any comments anybody wanted to make before we move on to, to just, yes, please, Susan. Uh, 
Um, I, I had uh, breast cancer when I was in my 40s and, and went through a lot of what uh, Janet talked about. And, and like her, they said, n you know, no talk about prevention after, you know, once the medical treatment was through, I had great medical treatment, but there, there was no talk about prevention. So I agree that 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 is really needed. And one of the things I learned was the American Cancer Society recommendations, which were really powerful and against what the government was saying. American Cancer Society recommended a largely plant-based diet. And Janet uh, mentioned that, that uh, avoiding animal products completely avoids a lot of those uh, antibiotics and other problems associated um, with animal products. But of course, there's a huge lobby behind consuming animal products. And, mm -hmm. and so that's part of the challenge in the US. How do you kind of see through um, you know, this push you know, to eat meat, to eat dairy products, when those things really can be quite harmful to you? And, and you can have a very healthy diet just on plant-based sources. Yeah, and I, I didn't discuss um, organic meat and dairy, which exists um, because, you know, there isn't time to cover everything in a presentation like this. But in fact, there are reasons why it's not good to even eat the organic meat and dairy. Um, it's just better to have a plant-based diet. There, there are a whole lot of reasons that we don't have time to go into, but uh, you're right that plant-based is better and people are starting to recognize it. I mean, it, it's much easier to eat a plant-based diet now. You can go to the store and buy things that are organic, also organic and um, it's just easier to eat a healthy diet than it was say 10 years ago. It was harder to get the ingredients that we can get now. There's a film on Netflix you might want to look at. It's called What the Health. Yes, I've seen it. It's a, it's a, my, my son and daughter-in-law watched it and they went vegan immediately. So they've been, they've been living with us for a few months now. And so our household is mostly vegan. Um, uh, Pat, Trish rather, sorry, Trish. Uh, two things that I want to comment is one with the advent of COVID, there has been an enormous increase in gardening. It's just gone through the roof. I mean, most of the seed companies in Canada are putting on their website, we're all out of half of our stuff and we don't think we'll be able to get any more. And people growing their own is something that was normal for me growing up. We grew everything. I mean, even popcorn and sunflower seeds and poppy seeds. We, uh, but uh, we're seeing a new generation becoming friendly with gardening again. So that really makes a plant-based diet easier. Uh, but the second thing is that at the same time, there is uh, an upsurge of highly processed so-called uh, uh, vegetarian foods like the, uh, the fake meats and such that are so highly processed that they really don't qualify in my idea of a plant-based diet because they've had so many chemicals added that they're back to be having all the bad things that meat have sometimes worse. So we have to really help people understand those subtleties about things and also if how they can take charge and how to make it easier to uh, eat. Yeah, it, yeah, you can have vegan diets that are not organic and that are not very healthy. So the basic thing is that things need to be organic. And I, I know, for example, I don't know if you have in Europe the Impossible Burger yet, but it's a, it's a plant-based burger. It tastes exactly like a hamburger. You could not tell it apart. It is delicious and it's juicy. Um, they do that with beet juice, but it, it tastes great, but it really is unhealthy because it has GMOs and it's got all kinds of stuff in it. And it's kind of heartbreaking because I would have it all the time if, you know, if it were healthier. Now I restrict myself to maybe twice a year because I'm just scared of the ingredients. Have venison instead. If you're going to, you know, ha, ha, have a safe meat, a safer meat like venison, rather than having that plant burger, you'll that's enjoy right. it more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, the um, wild game. I'm glad you mentioned that. Wild game is much safer than um, farm-raised animals because there are, well, a lot of reasons. Anyway. There, uh, I, that's really advisable. If you're going to eat any meat, wild game is is uh, the best choice. 
Yes, that's something that we do in our household. Um, my my son and daughter-in-law don't eat it, but that's what I I always get. That's the only meat I eat is is game, wild game. But um, is there anything else that you anybody would like to say? Or Janet, do you have any final comments? Because we're going to spend the last ten minutes talking about any updates on CSW. Well, um, I just want to say that you know I hope that the all of the things that I presented, I hope it didn't look too overwhelming because. Remember, cancer is cumulative. So any little change you make can reduce that accumulation. So anything that you feel comfortable doing, just go ahead and do, do what's easy. And then gradually you can add on. Uh, that's what I did. And it, you know, I pretty much, I pretty much follow all of those recommendations, but it took me a long time. I, I didn't just do it overnight. Well, as you say, it's, it's a big issue. And I think some of the things in the chat have said the same thing. They're, they're complex issues about um, lobbying and, uh, you know, particular interests and so forth. And some of that is covered in that film, What the Health in Netflix, and it, it's a good eye opener. There's also quite a difference between the standards of farming in the UK and Europe, for example, and America. It's a huge, huge difference. Um, and, uh, you know, we could go into that in much more detail in another in another time. So, Janet, thanks ever so much for coming. It was it was really great. And it's a thank you for inviting me. No, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, so please, thank you. Please, please don't go. Please stay. Thank you. And um, right. Just we just wanted to use the last uh, like six or seven minutes to just see if there's anything in particular that anybody wanted to know about CSW coming up. Was, was did anybody have any uh, questions that they wanted to raise or did they need any information or did have any did anybody have any updates that they wanted to share? So first of all, let's go and see. Does anybody have any questions about CSW, things that they still would like to know about or they're having problems with? Susan. Um, yes, I'm very interested in any way of finding out the status of the negotiations on the agreed conclusions. They, they've said the negotiations are going to take place basically before CSW. And so by the time we gather for CSW, it's going to be basically done. And so is there some way that the NGOs can, can get an update on what's happening with the negotiations? Um, does anybody want to answer that? Um, I can. I mean, I think that... Um, I think that the NGO uh, CSW committees are following the, the the negotiations to the extent that states parties give us information, and in and people NGOs who are on country delegations are also following what's happening. Um, Ula, would you like to say something on this? Yeah, I just want to add that uh, you know I just heard for the the Danish government today. Uh, I'm a part of the delegation, and they they said that we could not take part of the um, discussions and uh, negotiations this year uh, because they have very few places, so they have to use them themselves. So that is one of the things that is so sad with a shrinking space for NGOs. Uh, I just got the message uh, before this meeting. So, um, well, I don't know with the other uh, delegations, but uh, that is uh, from the Danish one, at least. Well, we had a meeting yesterday and what we heard is that all states parties are reducing their, their participation in CSW. And the Holy See, for example, is not going to be involved in any events. And the reason they aren't is because they said there's no point because states parties are reducing their um, their involvement. And therefore, there's no point in them putting any, you know, any effort into it because there, there's, there's no effect. It's not effective. And the UK government usually has about six events that it, it partners with different governments. And this year they have two and we haven't been able to get the full list of the delegation. They haven't decided who the delegation is going to be. It seems that it's going to be an under minister for the foreign office, my go, but not the minister for equality, it's not the minister for women. So the UK is also in the same, in the same boat in that it's not really participating in a very full way, whereas it has done in the past. Um, so that's, that's a different question, but I think in terms of um, being involved in the in the negotiations in past years they have also negotiated and almost got to to you know they'd already done quite a lot of work in a few days up up to 
pre-CSW and to the week before CSW, all, all emissions were negotiating on the zero draft before, and they're still doing the same thing now. Um, but we, I think that's a good good point for, for you to raise, Susan. It's something that we need to find out a bit more. Yeah, Ula. Yeah, I just wanted to add again that um, uh, we had the chance to come up with um, input for the first draft and now for the second draft. Very short notice, the 24 hours was the last one, but we did that in Subtimist International. And uh, we, uh, they also said in the message today that we are going to meet with the uh, UN mission in New York, the Danish one, uh, like we used to do face to face uh, normally every day, uh, but only one time I think, but I will have some more information next week. But I can really feel that everything is smaller and shrinking this year. Well, we are going to have a, a daily meeting with the UK mission, but what is interesting is the UK hadn't received the zero draft, we sent it to them. And I have heard nothing from them about the second iteration. No, so, okay. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it? That yeah. In the similar positions. So is there any other questions or comments from anybody about CSW? Susan, you look like you want to say something else. Uh, well, I'm I'm just um, very dismayed, you know, that that uh, because of COVID, I guess, uh, even member states are backing away from the CSW. Yet th this is a very important topic: participation of women in, in decision making. You know, mm. it's a hugely important topic, and it, you know, just like COVID, it kind of exposes the weaknesses in the system. You know, that there's this shrinking uh, civil space. There, you know, the NGOs are still kind of shut out of things. Um, you know, COVID has made it worse. Well, it's, it's also interesting in that there's still about, well, we know there's about 650 events on the platform. Um, and then in addition to that, many organizations are having events around CSW on Zoom or other and on other platforms. Um, so I would say there must be at least 700 events going on. And it's almost like it's become an NGO circus. And yeah. And to some extent, and if you have states parties in the room, you can influence, but the likelihood of being able to influence seems to have reduced. And one of the things that um, has been suggested is to make sure that the states parties are invited to do closing comments. But then other other people have had the experience that yes, that happens, but then they come and they have a, a member of staff or something listening in. And then they still only come in at the end and do closing comments without having actually listened to anything that went on before. So they're still not in the room. So it seems that the attitude there, then there is a, you know, one of the reasons why COVID is challenging amongst everything else is that it's an excuse. Um, it's it's a, a, a kind of, it's like a, a mist through which things can take place, which nobody is really paying attention to. That is why next year, hopefully when we can meet, we really have to uh, go for that we have face-to-face -face meetings like we used to have. And uh, because we are thinking that it's going to be virtual and face-to-face -face meetings. So we really have to work for face-to-face -face meetings and meet in the corridors and you know try to influence also politicians in the corners and so on. We miss that really. I think we all do that. We miss that a lot. Well, I think that we can push for it, but my own my own feeling is that it's it's highly unlikely. It's yeah, but we it. have to. We have and we have to work together to do that. Mm. I think we really have to um, to work many more organisations together um, to do this. Well, for me, I think that this you know what this whole situation has really thrown up is that the current methods that we have for working together on are, are not sufficiently strong they're not sufficiently robust we need to we need to work much stronger than we ever have before yeah. and we need to come together in ways we've never had before the women's movement has been weakened by this territorial behavior yeah. which is which is very masculine actually and and very kind of old world you know we we need to move ahead in a much more unified mm. unifying and collaborative way because otherwise we won't get anywhere 
So I think what you said, you know, is absolutely the case that we have, we, we have to work together, but the way we work together must be different mm. from the way we've worked in the past. It's really important that we strengthen the way we work together and build on our strengths. So recognize our diversity, but, you know, also, um, you know, strengthen our unity. Um, any of the last comments before we close in the last minute? Okay, well, um, thank you very much, everyone. I don't know about you, but I thought it was a very interesting event. And uh, it's really great that actually we can, we can see that there are so many different issues that we need to be engaged in as part of the Beijing Platform for Action. It still is so important in our everyday lives. And this is one of the areas. So Janet, thank you so much for coming and thank you very much for all your information. And uh, I'm hoping that Nina, when we send around the information, we can maybe share the list of resources that Janet shared with us at the end so that um, people who couldn't make it today will have access to that information. So thank you very much for coming everybody and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Nina. Thank you, Janet. <coughs> thank you, thank you. Daniela. Thank you.